Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Lynn Markey, and I'm the director of the Coalition for Life Sciences, and I'd like to welcome you to today's Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus Briefing. Um, before we start today's presentation, I'd like to thank the co-chairs of the caucus, and those co-chairs are Representative Steve Stivers from Ohio, Representative Joe Barton from Texas, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Steve Cohen from Tennessee. It's their commitment and dedication that allows the caucus to succeed and host these annual, uh, these monthly briefings. So it is my distinct pleasure today to introduce Dr. Kim Lewis. Dr. Lewis is a uni university distinguished professor and director at the Antimicrobacterial Discovery Center at Northeastern University in Boston and a fellow of the American Society of Microbiology. He obtained his PhD in biochemistry from Moscow University in 1980 and has been on the faculty of MIT, University of Maryland, Tufts University prior to coming to Northwest, Northeastern. Dr. Lewis has authored over 100 papers and is an inventor on several pa patents. He is a member of the Faculty 1000, a worldwide panel of experts evaluating research advancements. He is a recipient of the MIT C.E. Reed Faculty Initiative Award for Innovative Research Projects and is a recipient of the NIH Director's Transformative Award. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lewis. Uh, Lynn, thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. And today uh, I will tell you about Arising from the dirt, a new antibiotic breakthrough. Uh, I normally do not refer to my own work in terms of breakthrough, uh, but this is the title that uh, I think Lynn wanted me to have, so here it is. Uh, so for starters, I would like to put our findings in the, in the general context um, of antimicrobial discovery. Where are we at the moment, and how did we get into the uh, current predicament, uh, which is that uh, resistant microbes are on the rise and seem to be unchecked or largely unchecked. And we now have pathogens uh, that are resistant to all available antibiotics, like extremely or XDR resistant tuberculosis uh, and uh, Acinetobacter baumannii uh, that causes unhealing wounds uh, for which we have uh, currently no response. So we uh, once had a golden era of antibiotic discovery. Here it is, fueled by the findings of Selman Waxman, uh, a, a modest professor at Rutgers University, uh, who uh, developed a screen. He realized that soil microorganisms that live in a very dense environment probably fight each other with antibiotics. And he zeroed in on the group uh, that are most prolific producers of antibiotics, uh, actinomycetes and started isolating systematically antibiotics from them, including streptomycin, the first uh, drug that was effective in treating tuberculosis, for which we, he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and then, of course, everybody jumped in, the Merck's and the Pfizer's and the Eli Lilly's uh, of the world, and they became what they are now because of uh, the antibiotics they discovered using Selman Waxman's very simple uh, discovery method. And that lasted for a while, and we essentially were conquering the infectious diseases. We were in, in an extremely good shape uh, at, at the time. And then something happened. Something turned off the discovery, uh, the discovery uh, process. Yeah, and that something was very simple. Uh, it was over mining. It turns out that soil microorganisms make up only 1% yeah, of the total diversity of bacteria. 99% do not grow in our labs and are uncultured. And that 1% was over mined by the early 60s. And then we went into the dark ages where there was no new discovery. And then there's a little bit of a return of activity recently. But if you replot this, not by year of introduction into the clinic, but by year of discovery, then this collapses back to the golden era. So essentially what we've been doing, we've been taking compounds that were uh, discarded when they were discovered because they weren't good enough and we're resuscitating them because we don't have uh, anything new. So realizing that, of course, the industry and academia uh, responded by trying to develop synthetic compounds, not natural compounds from microbes, but synthetics. Uh, and um, there are enormous advances in science, of course. There's uh, genomics and proteomics that give you new targets 
in bacterial cells that could be hit by antibiotics. There's combinatorial chemistry, which provides an enormous variety of compounds uh, to hit those targets. And the end result of this very well thought through strategy was this, closing of anti-infectives divisions in the big farm. So it didn't work. So why did that not work? It didn't work because it turned out the synthetic compounds are literally running into the barrier. So this is an envelope of a gram-negative bacterium, uh, and it restricts the penetration of things that it doesn't want uh, to have inside the cell. And the way it does that is very simple. It has this thing that we call a multidrug pump. The first such pump was actually discovered by Olga Lamovska in my lab a number of years ago. And it physically pumps out drugs uh, outside of the cell. So synthetics failed. Natural compounds evolved over billions of years, uh, bypass this mechanism. How they do that, we do not understand very well. That's a very fruitful area of research. But we're not yet in a position to say that we know how to make compounds that are going to bypass this mechanism and get into the cell. So then. My colleague Slav Epstein uh, from Northeastern and I decided that we will take a different approach. We'll try, try to revive the Waxman platform. So this is Selman Waxman. Um, and we'll do that by going back to the soil and trying to figure out how to grow the remaining 99% of bacteria that have been inaccessible to us so far. So here's the simple basic experiment with uncultured bacteria that we do in our undergraduate laboratories at Northeastern University. You take a sample of soil, so it can be marine sediment, uh, marine sediment or soil, doesn't matter, and you put one droplet under the microscope and you count the cells. Another droplet goes on a petri dish and you count colonies that those cells formed. And the difference between these two counts is known as the great plates count anomaly. The enormous anomaly be, be, between the 100 cells that you see under the microscope and the one colony that they will produce. And that anomaly was discovered by uh, an Austrian microbiologist, Winterberg, in 1898. So that is the longest, uh, has been the longest unsolved problem in microbiology uh, and in biology uh, as a whole. Uh, so our reasoning was very simple. We figured that people spent 100 years tinkering with uh, growth conditions in the lab, and that didn't work. We know that uncultured bacteria do grow in the natural environment. So we figured that uh, instead of bringing bacteria into the laboratory, we'll do the exact opposite. We'll take uh, some version of a petri dish and bring it back to the environment. We will grow in pure culture organisms in their natural environment. So this is how it works. <clears throat> we take a sample, marine sediment or soil, we uh, mix it with agar, and then instead of putting it in a petri dish, we put it between these two semi-permeable membranes that then are glued onto this O-ring, which we buy in, at Home Depot. And I don't know what it does in real life, but uh, this contraption, uh, which we call the diffusion chamber, then goes back into the environment. Everything diffuses through these semi-permeable membranes. Cells cannot move, but molecules can. And so now bacteria are sitting in that chamber, but they're exposed to all the nutrients and growth factors of the natural environment. They do not know that something happened to them. So essentially, we're tricking them, right? We're tricking them into perceiving this as their natural environment. And pretty much everything grows. There's a, you get a whole zoo of colonies and a very high up to 50% recovery in terms of colonies, where on the regular Petri dish, there's a very little recovery from that particular environment. So that worked, that, that, was, that was very exciting. And at that point, we decided that, uh, apart from studying the basic science of the phenomenon, uh, it would be very useful to go after new antibiotics. So before I, I tell you about uh, the compound, uh, one of the compounds that we discovered, uh, I, I will take you through a number of uh, additional uh, developments or inventions that we have for growing uh, uncultured bacteria. So uh, one of the things that I told you Selman Waxman zeroed in on was a particular class of bacteria, Echinomyces, that are the most prolific producers of antibiotics. In our diffusion chamber, of course, everything grows, including Echinomyces. And they were thinking it would be very useful to have a device, a trap, if you will, that only grows Echinomyces and nothing else. So I'll show you how that trap works. 
being in Boston, it's not difficult to figure out how to do that because we borrowed the idea from the lobster trap. So here it is. It's a diffusion chamber with a slice of agar. It's as empty. We don't inoculate it with anything. And we place it on the surface of soil. Actinomycetes have this unique property that makes them different from other bacteria. They form hyphae and they can crawl through pores and solid media. So they'll be the only ones who will be able to crawl into this empty space. Empty space is very valuable. Soil is crowded with bacteria. The moment somebody senses empty space, they want to get there. So now you have a trap that specifically captures actinomyces that crawl in and form colonies. Uh, another thing that is very useful for our efforts to grow these uncultured bacteria is to understand why they are uncultured. This, this is an enormously fascinating paradox for us. Uh, it is indeed strange. We're used to thinking of bacteria as uh, being able to grow everything and foul everything, right? Uh, leave uh, a piece of fruit uh, on the counter for a week. You come back and it will be crawling with all kinds of creatures. Uh, and here, suddenly, 99% of bacteria do not grow on anything, including nutrient media that contains sugars and amino acids, exactly the nutrients that you will find in soil, the degradation products of plants and animals. Okay, so I'll tell you how we went about uh, solving that, that fascinating problem. We start, we, we decided first to select a particular environment, and the environment we decided to sand on the beach. Uh, because we figured that each of these sand particles, slightly enlarged here, will be covered with a layer of bacteria. And that's indeed the case here. So the, when you walk on the beach, this is what you're walking on. It is a thin layer of slime covering uh, every sand particle. Here is a... Um, uh, sort of uh, uh, an enlargement of that. Uh, this is a very important looking creature. I have no idea what it is. Uh, and so uh, using that environment, we were thinking that bacteria are growing there in close proximity to one another. And maybe the uncultured require growth factors that are produced by their neighbors. And we, if we don't know what those growth factors are, they're not go going to grow on our petri dishes. So here's a test of that, of that simple proposition. We take um, a sample from the environment, uh, dump it on a petri dish, and lots of stuff grows. And then we say, OK, maybe some of these colonies grew like this one, because it happened to be in the proximity of a cultivable organism that is donating a growth factor to it. And here's a, a test of that. Here's this uncultured organism spread around the plate, and it's growing only around this colony of the cultivable organism. So now, of course, we can grow up this cultivable organism, uh, fractionate it into fractions, and take these fractions one by one, add them on a petri dish as a drop. And you see here, fraction number three contains a substance that supports the growth of the uncultured organism. And we know uh, now what, that, uh, what these compounds are. They are iron chelating sidereophores. So normally, bacteria require iron, just like we do. Iron in the environment is insoluble. So bacterial cells have to release this molecule, a siderophore, which is an iron chelator. It grabs the insoluble iron and brings it back into the cell. And the uncultured organism doesn't have its own siderophore, so it steals it from its neighbors. So that is another powerful way uh, to grow uncultured bacteria and, and indeed to, uh, to understand this, this phenomenon. So, so the last method uh, I want to mention to you, uh, last but not least, uh, is the eye chip that was developed primarily in Slav Epstein's lab. And this is a massively parallel version of our original diffusion chamber. So the idea is pretty simple. I, I borrowed the schematic from BBC News. They have uh, a better artist on their staff than I do. Uh, so it, it, the eye chip is a simple piece of, a small piece of plastic with lots of holes in it. And you take this piece of plastic and you dip it in a suspension of bacteria. So then each of these wells captures approximately one cell, and you have isolated automatically. You don't have to worry about isolation. So you purify, you isolate, and you grow uh, in one step. And then you take two semipermeable membranes. You cover this piece of plastic with the membranes, and then this contraption goes back into the environment. So now in this simple piece of plastic, you can have 384 analogs of uh, diffusion chambers. And, and that gives you uh, a massive increase in, uh, in production. So using this method, we've been collaborating with a 
uh, biotech startup, Nova Biotic Pharmaceuticals in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and together we put, uh, um, uh, we amassed a library of 50,000 uh, formerly uncultured isolates to screen for new antibiotics. Here is the uh, eye chip in real life ready to go uh, into the soil. So one thing that we discovered early on, which is uh, very useful uh, for, uh, for producing antibiotics, is that once the colony grows in the diffusion chamber, with high probability, it will grow on a conventional petri dish. We call that domestication, just like you domesticate farm animals. Uh, we do not yet understand the molecular basis of the phenomenon, but we know that it is obviously uh, very useful. And here uh, is actually a, a typical Selman Waxman style screen, where on a petri dish you have a pathogen, Staph aureus, and you put here three colonies of formerly uncultured bacteria, and you ask the question, which of them is producing an antibiotic? Well, it's this one, because there's a zone of inhibition around this colony, which prevents Staph aureus uh, from growing. So using uh, the screening uh, of this type, uh, 25 new antibiotics have been discovered from uncultured bacteria so far. Three of them are very interesting, most of them are not going to uh, be developed into drugs, and that's just uh, the typical situation with drug discovery. The rule of thumb is that you need a, a approximately 50 good leads to get one drug. So, uh, and that is a reminder to us and to everybody else that you really need to have uh, platforms for antibiotic discovery, because if your favorite compound failed, then you pull the next one out of your platform. If you don't have a platform, then that, that becomes a highly, highly problematic a proposition. Okay, so here is uh, Texobactin. Uh, Texobactin was discovered from a very interesting bacterium, this one, which lives somewhere in a grassy field in Maine, maybe somewhere else, but that's where we picked it up from. Uh, and we gave it this romantic name, Eleftheria terra. Uh, Eleftheris in Greek is freedom, terra is of course earth. So this is free earth. Uh, you'll see in a moment why that, why that connotation. And uh, texobactin, the compound that it makes, it comes from the Greek word texos, which is, which is wall. You'll also see in a moment why, why we came up with that name. Um, so one of the first things that we do when we have a new compound, we of course test its activity against uh, uh, nasty pathogens. And here's a list of such pathogens. So it has very high activity against uh, MRSA staph aureus, about against vancomycin resistant enterococcus faecalis, to which we have very limited therapeutic options currently. It causes infective endocarditis, disease of the heart, which is extremely difficult to treat. Uh, it is also very active against M. tuberculosis, and that is very important. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. It is less active against gram negative bacteria, but we're working on broadening the spectrum to uh, enclose gram to include gram-negative pathogens as well. Uh, we are, of course, on the lookout for compounds that have low resistance uh, to antibiotics. And so early on, we test that. The test is very simple. You put your antibiotic in a Petri dish, and then you uh, plate a, a large number of cells on that Petri dish and see if any colonies of resistant uh, mutants arise. So by that test, there were no resistant mutants. And that is not necessarily a good thing. Actually, I was very disappointed when I saw that result. And the reason I was disappointed is because I thought that we discovered a new detergent. So what uh, often happens, bacteria, apart from sophisticated antibiotics, they also make detergents, things that you find in soap. Uh, and these things dissolve bacterial membranes, but they, they also dissolve our membranes, right? The membranes of our cells. It's just generally toxic things, and of course there's no resistance to that. It's just generally toxic junk. But uh, looking for things that have low resistance, we also have this test early on. Cited toxicity. So we tested this compound for toxicity against human cells, and there was no toxicity. So that was really amazing. Here's a compound to which there's no resistance, and yet it has no toxicity against mammalian cells. So it has to be doing something very specific against bacteria. So why is there no resistance? Because they're supposed to be resistance to everything. So we, we were very intrigued with that and started studying this compound uh, and ran uh, a test. This was done by, by Lucy Ling uh, from Noah Biotic. 
a test that invites the pathogen to develop resistance. These are conditions most conducive to developing resistance. So what you do here is you take compound like ofloxacin, which is one of the uh, currently available antibiotics. You add it at a concentration which is sub-inhibitory. So it inhibits growth a little bit, but doesn't kill the pathogen. And then there, if there's any resistant mutant, it will overcome the population. And then you re-inoculate it the next day at slightly higher concentration, and you keep doing that. And finally, your resistance goes through the roof. In this case, it increases 250-fold. And that happens with each antibiotic in this test. The only antibiotic that doesn't happen to is texobactin. There's absolutely no change in resistance after 27 re-inoculations. And we, just to believe ourselves, repeated it twice, right? So uh, it was uh, repeated in a total three times, and we got the same result against the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So now we have uh, a compound to which there is uh, no observable resistance development. Now, I'm not going to ta take you through the mechanism of action. This is a slide for professionals, so, but bear with me. I have a, a, a bit of a simplified version to tell you in simple terms uh, what it does and why there is no observable resistance to take So first of all, we, uh, we reasoned when we, when, we found, uh, when we got that result that uh, there is no resistance development, that we reasoned that that the target of this compound is not going to be a protein. So most antibiotics hit important proteins in the cell. Uh, proteins are coded by genes, they mutate, and the most common mechanism of resistance is when your protein is changed due to mutation and no longer binds the antibiotics. So that's how you get resistance. If there's no resistance, then your target is not a mutable protein, but it should be something else which does not change by mutation. So then we figured that it's probably a precursor of, uh, of an important cell polymer, which is not a protein. And that's what it turned out to be. The cell wall of bacteria is made of peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan has a precursor, it's called lipid 2, and that is what takes a bactin binds to. So it binds to an immutable precursor of peptidoglycan. To make things more interesting, it also binds at the surface of the cell, so you cannot extrude that compound with a multi-drug pump because it's already uh, at the external environment. And it also binds a, a, a related precursor of a related polymer, Waltecoic acid. So now it binds two different targets that have to be changed simultaneously in order to get resistance. Neither of them is a mutable protein. So that, I think, explains the remarkable uh, property of texobactin to be essentially uh, free of resistance. Uh, so uh, this finding tells us a number of interesting things. So first of all, it suggests to us that the dogma under which we were operating, uh, that uh, bacteria will always develop resistance to antibiotics, and we simply have to run faster than the pathogens and introduce compounds you know, faster than they develop resistance, be in the rat race, that's not necessarily the case. Here is an example of a compound that Mother Nature evolved to be essentially free of resistance. Uh, there's no question in my mind that there will be additional compounds like that uh, yet to be discovered, which will change uh, uh, the way we think about uh, strategically uh, handling uh, the problem of antibiotics. And the other thing is that, of course, uh, this uh, and other interesting compounds that we discovered together with Novobiotic uh, tells us that we are probably uh, at the beginning of a revival of antibiotic discovery because the enormous diversity of uncultured bacteria on the planet, of course, uh, are an essentially an exhaustible source of new and interesting compounds, because our very modest effort produced uh, you know, such remarkable things like uh, texobactin. Uh, and then uh, finally, I want to show you that when you find something new, it forces you to rethink the way, uh, the, the way we do things and allows you to take advantage of uh, opportunities that, that weren't available before. And I will show you one of such things uh, as an example of what you can do with texobactin, which was not available to us before. So uh, I'll just mention briefly that texobactin behaves well in curing mice of infections. Mice actually are not a bad model of human infections. We're not that you may think that we're different from mice, but not so much. 
Uh, and uh, taxobactin cures mice very well of uh, blood infection, so uh, completely protects. So here's death with, uh, of untreated mice. There's complete protection with taxobactin. Uh, it protects very, mice, uh, very nicely in the mouse thigh infection, decreasing the bacterial burden and completely uh, uh, decreases the bacterial burden uh, in the lung infection of strep pneumonia. So taxobactin is, go is going into development, and while that is happening, there's another interesting thing that we decided to check out. So here is a killing uh, of Staph aureus by different uh, antibiotics. Here's vancomycin. It doesn't kill very well. This is the leading, our leading antibiotic at the moment. Oxacillin kills very well, but there's enormous resistance to oxacillin, so it's essentially not used against Staph aureus anymore. Texobactin kills like oxacillin, so this is, of course, a very important, a very useful property. But you will notice it doesn't, it doesn't eradicate the population, right? Here's a stubborn subpopulation of cells that do not die. Uh, these we call persisters. All pathogens form a small subpopulation of dormant cells which are persisters, they're spore-like and cannot be killed with antibiotics. And that is an enormous problem, uh, and that explains the recalcitrance of chronic infections to antimicrobial therapy, even to therapy by compounds that supposedly the pathogen is supposed to be susceptible to. But its persisters are not going to be susceptible. They will survive to live another day and, and fuel the relapse of the infection. So I will show you how we decided to use taxobactin to get rid of persister cells and uh, eradicate a chronic infection. So the most difficult in, uh, chronic infection to treat uh, is, uh, are those that are formed by biofilms. So once uh, a pathogen attaches to an indwelling device like a heart valve or a hip prosthesis or, or a bone in infective osteomyelitis, it forms this mass of cells called the biofilm extremely difficult to eradicate. Often people end up, well, either dead or uh, with, a, with a limb that has to be amputated uh, because of the uh, untreatable infection. So here's our experiment. Here are 12 biofilms growing in 12 different test tubes. We hit them with taxobactin. Uh, growing cells of those biofilms are killed and persisters survive. And this is sort of typically what you get with any antibiotic. But then we decided that we can try to do pulse dosing. So at this point, uh, we take away, we wash away the antibiotic, allow the persisters to start reawakening, but do not allow them to restore the population. So they just started waking up, and then we hit them with the antibiotic again, another pulse. And here are surviving persisters. We keep doing that, and in a couple of pulses, almost all biofilms are gone. I proposed this idea a couple of years ago, and physicians were not thrilled. Uh, I was told that uh, this is playing with fire. This invites resistance development. We want to keep the concentration of antibiotic at all times high. Once you start tinkering with it, you know, pulse dosing, decreasing it, washing it away, uh, withdrawing it, you will invite resistance development. So that was shut down. With taxobactin, there is no resistance development. We don't have to worry about things like that. And here I think that pulse dosing with taxobactin is another very exciting opportunity that is given to us by the compound with, uh, with features that we did not uh, you know, anticipate exist. Uh, so with that, uh, I will thank uh, my team, my collaborators, especially support uh, from the NIH that enabled uh, this work, and I uh, thank you for listening. Experiment would predict 
that 12, that of these, uh, if these were people, 11 would be cured and what would not be cured. I would take those odds today, you know, because, oh, yeah. right? But why this survived is a fascinating question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Okay, and now I answer my other two questions. Sure. So, uh, so the question on where we are in development. Uh, so we think that we need about two more years of uh, preclinical development, advanced uh, studies for toxicity and efficacy in other animal models. Then that will allow us to go into the clinic and to phase one, two, and three clinical trials, which is another three years. So an optimistic scenario says that it should be available as a drug in about five years from now. Uh, and uh, your other question was, uh, uh, you know, how to go in a focused matter, manner about discovery, right? So right now, we're sampling soils all over uh, United States of America, in our backyards, you know, in, in, in Maine and other states. And that has been a completely random process. And that's something that I would like to change exactly as, uh, as, you're, as you're saying. I would like to intelligently screen the soils, first of all and see if they're not hot spots, if they're not places uh, you know, on Mother Earth, which are especially conducive to antibiotic producers, and then go after, after those places. Yes, I'm curious if you, uh, with your soil diffusion chambers, if you've taken Texio back and back to the initial soil it was discovered in and tested for resistance in that environment, uh, that is an interesting question. We have not done that. Uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you, but I understand sort of the connotation uh, of your question. Uh, the bigger question is, is it possible that somewhere there is an organism on this planet that is resistant uh, to take sobactin, and maybe that resistance is going to travel to our pathogens over time? There's a somewhat related compound, vancomycin, that I mentioned that hits the same target, uh, lipid 2, but it hits it in a place that is modifiable. The producer of vancomycin had to protect itself from its own compound, and it has a special biochemical pathway modifying, modifying that target. And 30 years after introduction of vancomycin of the clinic, uh, into the clinic, that resistance mechanism traveled from soil, from the or organs that makes vancomycin, into enterococci uh, and other bacteria. In the case of texobactin, the producer protects itself because it pumps it out. It doesn't have any specific resistance mechanism. There's absolutely nothing to borrow. So my prediction is if the resistance mechanism exists somewhere on Earth, it will take more than 30 years to travel into the clinic. So from that perspective, more than, I would say more than 30 years or never is probably very similar because I do hope and believe that in 30 years from now, our chemists will get their act together and we'll figure out how to synthesize new antibiotics. Thank you very much. Thank you.